are interesting things, aren't they? I often have interesting dreams. I thought they'd stop. I thought they'd stop. As I became an adult, you know? I used to dream journal when I was a kid. Well, when I was an early adolescent, really. I could never quite capture the flavor of the dream. So I stopped. Maybe I just stopped. But I still remember many of them. Often. Because I wrote them down, you know. Sometimes I would wonder rather it was suggested, an idea was suggested to me. And I began to wonder if, um, the act of recording and then re, um, discovering the dreams that I had written down changed them, you know, if I was remembering a memory, a false memory. But I never felt like I did. I would like read a few words and then wait for some image or sensation to be primed and then use that to like, um, unlock or uh, invoke or associate with other part of the, parts of the dream, you know? And once I started doing that, I didn't, um, I didn't bother to write down the words so much anymore. Which I guess is a shame, maybe, but... It's also this really I guess it's intimate more than strange, you know. This is kind of sadness. I um a sadness to record the dreams on paper you know, with words. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I become acutely aware how how very much I want to hold on to something that I can't hold on to. And it's not that I can't, you know, or it's difficult. It's, it has nothing to do with whether or not the dream is preserved. It reminds me about myself. It reminds me of my personality. It reminds me of something that has nothing to do with dreaming at all, necessarily. It could, something else could remind me of this. Again, it's intimate. It's, it's like a very strange and silent idiosyncrasy. I am. Um, it just reminds me how sad I am. Sometimes I would dream about something that I find so beautiful. It reminds me that that 
like just how much it is that I, I miss out on in life. Do you know what I mean? Like I forget that. Maybe to be okay with it or it's just desensitization. Yeah. My dreams are very inventive. It's lovely. I just woke up from a dream. I dreamt that I was a, oh God, a school teacher in Russia. That's a new one. It was like a public education. The kids. <coughs> they were about ten years old. I remember being, I remember being struck by. Like the shape of the classroom, it seemed to be like the ceiling was higher than it. the walls were far apart. That's an exaggeration, but it wasn't like the classroom that I had. It seemed more like a hospital room. Um, there were far fewer students. Maybe 12 of them came in. And I remember in the dream, waiting for, it was my first day. I hadn't met them yet, right? And I don't remember why I was there. I couldn't believe that only 12 kids came to sit. And that was like appropriate, you know. I remember um, my classes were like 30 kids and they kept pushing them. <coughs> I'm sorry. The number of st <coughs> students every year get up to 32 at one time. <coughs> um, the themes of the dream. Just, I'm surprised at the detail. The details. like the level of clarity because sometimes dreams are fevered and stupid or um, you ever had that thing where you can't read or you can't move speak it was very lucid it was, it was mundane I wasn't like thrilled to be there you know So what? And it, uh, powder blue walls faded from sunlight, so it seemed unremarkable. Desks and computers. I didn't even take roll call. I was just kind of like... I don't know, like vamping before a show. I don't know how to describe it any more than that. As the kids trickle in and just banter and try to get to know people. Or kids. <clears throat> there was a kid with a Walkman. And it was uh, blaring a little bit. It kind of irritated me. I was disappointed that I was irritated. Because I was trying to be jovial. And I was. But, um, I don't know, there, there were a lot of little distractions in the room that I was trying to turn off one by one, so the lesson could be good. <coughs> this kid was listening to Van Halen. I asked him what he was listening to. I, that, that made me chuckle. It's, it totally was a very real, realistic thing. You know, some, it resembled things I've seen in life. Um... Yeah, there were like little broadcasts coming out of, um, I don't know, some integrated media players that were at little computer stations. Very quiet, just like someone had left the thing on. I had to go around and find those. 
I kept trying to address the class here and there, but I couldn't hold their attention. At one point, like a supervisor walked in and sat down to like observe me, right? And he took, <coughs> he like interrupted me with an address. So whenever, just started over. And that's, that's it. There was more, a little bit. It doesn't matter. It was just more details like that. It was like a normal, boring day. <laughs> and it was remarkable because of the level of detail. I was I remember being surprised at the things that <clears throat> school officials expected of the kids were very strict about and the things that they were very lax about. The last thing, I had this problem where I, I finally got to addressing the class. And the, I finally started the, the lesson. And the supervisor interrupted me, like congenially, you know, he wasn't like a, I wasn't bothered by him. But uh, he pointed out that a few of the kids didn't belong in the class. Like they were part of another class, like they were of the grade, but they belonged to a different teacher. <laughs> and the kids had like no, <coughs> they just got up and went back to the other class. And they had no fear of punishment or anything. I say that because that's, when I was their age or whatever, you were strictly forbidden to go to another classroom, any other classroom that wasn't yours. It was like a major no-no. And people get really upset. And I could never understand that. I mean, it's I didn't even question it, you know? I was like, all right, it's a big deal. And so it was just like this senseless big deal piled on top of a bunch of other senseless big deals that I didn't question or understand, but I totally accepted the irrational volatility of the culture that I was entrusted to. <clears throat> told to be grateful for it, told to like praise it. I don't know how I felt about that. I was never particularly I can't remember any, I have no specific memories of being particularly rebellious against institutions that I was a part of, you know, but having this dream and seeing that detail, you know, to them, it, it, to the, the kids in my imaginary Russia, it wasn't a problem at all, you know, it would have seemed nonsensical. The emotional gravity of it wasn't there. I don't know why the things that upset my administrators upset them so they would never say. I encountered that a lot. In life. It gave me a strange view of authority. Kind of a mistrust, but more of a... I don't know. 
So anyway, I'm almost done with this dream. <coughs> There's only one more part. I don't know why I have a cough. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, polo field. I'm still the teacher. I'm still out. I don't know what part of the day it is. But, um. Polo field. Student and her younger sibling. They're like going home or something along the path, and I'm watching them like a movie. <clears throat> I'm supposed to know them. I don't know them. That's like good. I, I don't know how to describe that. Again, it's like I'm watching a movie. It's implied that like, I know them, which is a weird thing that dreams can do. <clears throat> soccer in a polo field like um, these two have a caretaker and they're going to him and he's like a peer of mine I don't know him too well either, but he knows me, and he's, like, familiar with me, you know? So these kids must be familiar with to, to me as well in the dream. We ended up on a polo field where, a, like, an English polo match is being played. And you walk through it, which is absurd. But the way that, like, I don't know. Imagine, um... A soccer game, a public place soccer game being played <clears throat> in on a pitch that isn't a pitch. It's just an open lawn. So you're allowing the people there to play soccer and not be bothered by it, even though the soccer game is kind of taken up a, over the pitch. You still feel like you can just walk through the game and it's not a big deal. And there's this implicit, unspoken understanding, social understanding for that moment that, like, no one's going to be, everyone is bending the rules here, or, like, just letting it slide. No one's going to bother anyone else because everyone is just having fun, and it's kind of absurd. And, uh, we have, I don't know. It's a really hard thing to describe simply with words. And it's a very dis odd thing in retrospect to apply a fucking polo game to because they had the blazers and the horses and the mallets and the <laughs> it was not like a game just broke out. But there it was. <clears throat> and um, me and the kids were crossing the field to the the dad or the brother or the caretaker or whoever it was to this guy and I was a little afraid that I, I thought eh, this is a little dangerous but I was like in a different country <clears throat> so you just kind of go along with it you know and um, I just remember getting really tired on the field and um, being separated from them. They were within, like, line of sight of each other and grouped up. <clears throat> they linked to each other with a soccer ball pass and maybe started to, like, toddle off out of the field. And it wasn't even a thing. And I just couldn't move. I, like, ran out of energy. <clears throat> And I was on like the the edge of the field while this polo game is going on. And I remember 
remember looking like the sun was setting and casting a shadow and I, I kind of was too afraid to look into the pitch <clears throat> but I wanted to not get trampled by a horse so I just kept watching the shadows that were cast by the game to my left which was immediately at the immediate boundaries of the field and uh The dream's winding to an end. I'm just kind of noticing it. Didn't none of this seem absurd to me at all at the time in the dream? So my legs are getting very heavy, and like I I collapse, not painfully, but like I just can't. I think in reality I was waking up, <coughs> and I was entering that like sleep paralysis stage, you know. And, uh, anyway, I remember the, the guy and the kids, the guy came to check on me. He was like, hey, come on, are you going to come? And that kind of thing. I remember he, he kicked a long lobbing pass to me. I couldn't move. I was like on my knees at that point. But to be masculine... And kind of like shoot, like play. I don't know why this is part of the dream, but to show him that, like, yeah, I'm coming. Hold on. I would. I caught the ball like a goalie, you know, to show I had like faculty still. Tossed it back to him. Hold on to this dipshit. I'll be right there. Hold on. Like that kind of shit. <coughs> and. Um, I just, I didn't want to be embarrassed, so I was like, all right, I gotta get up and move. And I just couldn't move. And then I noticed um, a pony without a rider or a bridle. I don't know, there were just horses around now. And uh, all of my attention went to that thing because I thought it was adorable. It was kind of an odd pony, actually. Like, it was too... It was kind of cartoonish. Again, very hard to describe. But... He was really amiable. And he saw this other pony. Which was kind of near me. And they started playing together. And I thought it was like the cutest fucking thing. Out of nowhere. And it made me feel not so bad about, you know, like, I neurotically in this fucking dream, I care about this figment of my imagination's opinion of me, who even in the dream I just met, you know, so I see this happening and I feel relief because I can play off the, the, the dancing horses to him you know, to placate my own ego and be like, no, I was just hanging out with those horses. What's your problem, you know? And then I, I woke up pretty much. I don't mean to just leave it there, but I'm kind of tired of talking right now. I'm not even sure if this... Um, will develop. I'm in very low light, obviously. I'll do another one.